and uh, all the rest of uh, all the rest of your uh, classmates uh, here. Uh, I've, my name is Ryan Turner. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my path that took me from uh, from you know from high school and days of kind of hanging out and not paying much attention and not having much time for school uh, to eventually to Berkeley uh, and then uh, to engineering on what's known as the Plate Boundary Observatory. So my, uh, my title is field engineer, but all of my background is in geophysics. So I studied active tectonics, meaning how plates, how, te how the tectonic plates are moving right now. And we'll talk a little bit, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how, how some of that stuff goes. If stuff uh, comes up for you, it's not a huge number of people here. If you have a question or whatever, uh, feel free to, to, to ask it. Um, there'll be time at the end, but if you've got a question while it's happening, feel free. Um, so this is me and, um, this is my email if you uh, if you want to reach out for any reason. Uh, what I'm doing in this photograph is, uh, this is, a, I don't know if you guys have ever been out towards the Eastern Sierra, but this is a Long Valley. So these are the Sierra Mountains. The other side of those mountains is the Central Valley, Fresno and all that kind of stuff. So this is on the Eastern side of the Sierra, which are uh, one of my favorite places in all of California. Uh, really a spectacular place. And where, where I'm actually working here is at the top of, a, of about a thousand foot high tile, a pile of, uh, of rubble, uh, mostly granite. And what I'm working on is, is this right here, which is a, a, a precision GPS monument. And that's, this is the, sort of the, the focus of, of my work now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the research I did as a graduate student and as an undergrad, and then about the work that I'm doing now, and, uh, and then a little bit about how this stuff actually actually works and what we're doing with it and how it's relevant to you guys right here. Uh, so, sorry for the wall of text, uh, but uh, I basically, uh, I, I didn't have much time for high school. Uh, I dropped out of high school, uh, did the equivalency tests and wound up doing a sort of continuation school kind of thing. I really just was not, I, I didn't have much time for it. I spent a lot of time doing other things. I worked as a aircraft mechanic, I worked as a sysadmin for a now defunct tech company, this would have been like in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. I worked, I lived in China for a while and taught English. Uh, I worked as a, as, a, uh, <laughs> as a volunteer park ranger in Patagonia, so I did a lot of like different stuff to just kind of be out and like find ways to make a living wherever I was. And uh, at some point decided that I wanted to do something different and that if I wanted to do something really fulfilling, I was probably going to have to go to school. It's a conclusion probably most of you have reached at this point. Uh, I was a little late on board. I uh, didn't hit that until about 26 and I started at community college. I went to Diablo Valley College, which is over in Pleasant Hill. Uh, and I started working as a volunteer at Chabot Space and Science Center. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that place, but uh, I started working there because they've got these awesome telescopes. They got a 20 inch, 36 inch, and eight inch telescope there. And as a volunteer, you can actually operate those telescopes. And I thought that was just about the coolest thing. So I started working there as a volunteer um, and hoping that they would eventually start paying me and I, that worked. Uh, so that's you know, one path to hopefully getting a job occasionally. Uh, and so I wound up running the planetarium there for several years while I was at community college. I spent, s I think six or seven years at Diablo Valley College. So having dropped out of high school uh, and then deciding that I was going to study physics, I had a lot of um, I had a lot of math to make up. I think I got through about I, th I started at, at, at community college. I started with geometry and went all the way through just about everything that was available. So I started with geometry. It was in a trig class that I had a professor that like explained a few things to me, and I sort of realized that I wasn't as bad at math as I thought I was. And so instead of Originally, I was thinking archaeology, and I said, no, I'm going to, I maybe I'll do science. And so I thought I would do physics. So I had to go through all the math, uh, which, uh, which I, I, I did well enough, I guess. <laughs> I wish, I, I would have liked to have done better on some of those fundamental things, but I did okay. Um, and wound up transferring to Berkeley in 2010. And I was really worried when I went from, uh, from community college to UC that I had done pretty well in community college, but I was like, this is gonna be, this be a lot of clever people there. 
<laughs> and uh, I did not think that, I, I don't know, I just wasn't sure how it was going to go. I was pretty concerned about it. Um, but I found it surprisingly easy to get involved in research and get involved in things that were, that were important to me. Um, in the EPS, Earth and Planetary Science Department, I found like a fairly small, uh, fairly small, uh, it's a fairly small department with a pretty outsized kind of uh, research footprint. They do a lot of really cool stuff in a lot of different fields. And I was able to get involved there uh, as an undergrad. Uh, took my BA in geophysics in 2012 and then went straight into what they call a professional master's program. And, uh, and within the context of my master's program, I published my first paper, which was uh, really a collection of research that I did as an undergrad. So the work that I was doing as an undergrad wound up turning into a paper. And then continued doing the same kind of work for several summers. So I sort of had a summer job at the, at the research lab while, we were, while I was going through all this. Um, within the context of my master's, I wound up TAing, or GS, they call them GSIs in Berkeley, like graduate student instructors. So I was a graduate student instructor for planets and for astronomy, or intro to astronomy. Is there, this was a class of like 300 people, this was a class of like 800 people. So there was like a small army of, of GSIs operating these classes. But it was a lot of fun, uh, and the fact that I had all this background in astronomy positioned me pretty well to be able to actually teach at like an undergrad level for, um, for some of that stuff. Uh, I took my master's. Uh, it was normally it's an MA program, but I had already had one paper published and I had another on the way, so I kind of got them to give me an MS instead. So I wound up with an MS in Earth and Planetary Science, and um, then spent a few months unemployed. Uh, it was a sort of I, my wife was working and I was just hanging out with our baby son for a while, and then eventually found. Uh, what that caused me to do is it caused me to widen my search pattern over and over again until I started looking for jobs that were not in the Bay Area and that were elsewhere because I was getting pretty, pretty desperate to find something for work. And I saw an ad for a job in San Clemente um, with a company called UNAVCO. And I'll get into that uh, in a minute. But uh, while working there is where I managed to finish my second paper. Uh, so this is a couple of field photos from, from when I was at Berkeley. Uh, doing mapping. This is actually not a notepad, but a little laptop where we were actually in the field marking, you know, with a GPS unit uh, on the laptop, sort of marking things and, and mapping some of the geology of the, of the Berkeley Hills. Now, this is out in Winnemucca, Nevada, conducting a magnetotelluric survey, helping, well, mostly getting in the way of professionals that were actually conducting a survey, but helping ostensibly to, to conduct a, a magnetotelluric survey uh, with uh, for looking, basically looking for really small amounts of gold uh, in, the, in the Nevada hills. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the, I mean, you're not, this is none of this, is, uh, don't have to read all this, but this is uh, the first bit of research. The first paper that I did was published in GRL, and it was about aseismic slip and fault interaction. And you know, I, I, I was, uh, in, in 1989, um, I was 11 years old, and I remember very clearly the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, some of you will remember it, some of you will not. Uh, but it definitely, it definitely left a mark, uh, even at 11, uh, and really kind of got me interested in earthquakes and things like that. And so my uh, study area was actually directly in relation to, to, the, uh, to the San Andreas Fault and, 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 and the area of the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, Specifically, so uh, this is sort of this shows you the area of the Loma Prieta, or sorry, the Loma Prieta earthquake. This is the the fault plane that sort of slipped, uh, and what my research focused on were these little tiny things called repeating earthquakes, um, and they're very small earthquakes, you know, magnitude two or three, and they're caused by on parts of the fault, you know, some parts of earthquake faults, some parts of, of these faults. Up here, for example, they, they're locked, right? They don't, they don't move all the time. They just, they're locked, they're stuck. And then eventually they build up a ton of pressure and they fail and they create large earthquakes. And that's what happens up here um, in, in the Santa Cruz area. South of Gilroy and south of San Juan Batista, the San Andreas acts very differently. It actually just slowly creeps. Uh, and it, it's moving all the time. And 
what that means is that most of the fault is unlocked, but there's these little spots that stick and fail, just like larger locked portions, but they're just small. You can think of them as like rough spots on a, on a very smooth fault surface. And those rough spots, they, they load up pressure and then they fail. But they load up pressure and fail in a really, uh, in a way that's correlated with, with how much slip is happening on the surface. And so you can use these sort of like what we call a, a creep meter under the surface. It'll tell you how much the fault is moving, except it's several kilometers down. So it's really, really sensitive. It's a really, you can use these little earthquakes as, uh, as instruments, basically. And so my work was about trying to define where the end of that happened. So what you're seeing here, these are, the, these are um, older repeating earthquakes that a colleague had found sometime in the mid-90s um, in his own uh, PhD work. And then what he and I did was to extend that into this area. Now, it's hard to see on here, but I don't know if you can see these teeny tiny little gray dots in here, but those little teeny tiny gray dots are all earthquakes um, that have happened at some point. And what, we, what he couldn't do in the mid-90s because computer processing power was a little more expensive was to actually dig into all of those earthquakes and try to look for some of these repeating earthquakes. Uh, and so what we did is, I, I went through and did that stuff now that there was a little bit more processing power, it was a little less expensive to do that. And so I was able to sort of finish that catalog and see where it ended. And what it showed us is that that creep that we see in repeating earthquakes extends all the way up to about here, that it happens also on this other sub-parallel fault called the, called the Sargent, and then it ends. And there's a couple of little repeating earthquake spots over here, but they're, they, don't, they don't last very long. So this is sort of the, the basic idea, sort of defining that, and it was using a lot of statistical models, looking at uh, the waveforms of the earthquakes and doing cross-correlation, where you're looking at one waveform and another waveform and comparing them, and trying to find those, those repeating earthquakes. Uh, the other paper I did was sort of an extension on this, and it brought in more, uh, it brought in more information uh, in a larger area. So instead of just looking, we're, we moved south a little bit. Up here is the area where I had studied before, up in the northern end. And this is more in the central part of the San Andreas Fault. Between about San Juan Batista and Parkfield, this is the area where the fault just smooths, that smoothly slips. It doesn't fail in big earthquakes. It just slowly creeps. And so what I wanted to do was tie the repeating earthquakes, so now you're seeing all those little black spots are my repeating earthquakes. All these little squares are GPS stations that are part of the plate boundary observatory. So those are by far the most precise method we have of examining how a spot on the Earth is moving. Those antennas that I showed you in the beginning working on, that system will show us how a, a position on the Earth is moving to within uh, a millimeter or so. So it's not like a GPS in your phone where you get maybe three meters of accuracy or so if you're lucky. You're talking about millimeter level accuracy. Um, excuse me, millimeter level precision. Uh, and uh, so this, those are the individual GPS spots. So now we're tying together uh, these creep meters that are um, the, the, the repeating earthquakes that we're using these creep meters, actual creep meters, uh, this one here and this one here, the GPS data and something referred to as INSAR, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. And these are satellites that fly over and they take ranging estimates, one-dimensional ranging estimates. And by you know, taking differences of these images, you can, you can sort of get a sense of motion. You zero them out, um, you know, make zero motion on the fault, and this sort of tells you what everything's doing. And it shows you that this side of the fault's moving that way, that side's moving that way. And what I was really looking for wasn't just, um, wasn't just the motion. This is all known. This is all known stuff. What I was looking for was correlation uh, in through time. Because what's happening is that it doesn't just slip smoothly at a constant rate. It goes faster and slower and faster and slower. And this had been shown in repeating earthquakes, but it hadn't really been shown conclusively in GPS data or in interferometric synthetic capture radar. So, what you're looking here is, you know, these are uh, earthquakes telling me how a particular area, so what I did is I looked at just this particular area right here, and you'll hear me refer to mid, near field, mid field, and far field. So I took 
an average of those repeating earthquakes and these strips of INSAR data. I chose that area because we have a couple of GPS sites that are on opposite sides of the fault, so that's a really helpful way of constraining the data. Uh, and what we found is here's the repeating earthquakes and what that area was appearing to do through time. So here's time on one axis and displacement on the other. So as you can see, they slowly move, um, they, they slowly become displaced because everything's moving. But if you remove that long-term trend and just look at the residuals, then you can start to see patterns in the data. And the black is, are the repeating earthquakes. And what I'd like you to focus on is the darkest of the red, um, those red lines, which is the far field of the INSAR. And the correlation is not perfect, but you can kind of see that there's something in the, what this is showing you is in the red, you can see this red is kind of leading the, uh, the black line. Right, so there's a little bit of a hump in the red, and then there's a little bit of a hump in the black. There's a little bit of a hump in the red, and then there's a little bit of a hump in the black. And the same with the red and the black again. And what that sort of showed us is that stuff that's happening out here happens first, and then shortly thereafter, the um, what's happening on the on the on the plates catches or right on the fault interface catches up with it. Right? So this is uh, this was basically the the the, the main. Uh, argument of the of the paper, and we went through a lot more statistical methods and things like that. But that was that was sort of the focus of my research. The first one as an undergrad, and this as a grad student. Can you like sum up what that means? How do you mean? Like so, you have motion happening farther away from the fault. Mm -hmm. That sort of predicts motion that happens along the fault. Right. So what the the, the Thank you. The, the overall relevance here is that not all parts of the world, in fact, most parts of the world, do not have these incredible networks of seismic instruments, right? These huge numbers of GPS stations, uh, creep meters, you know, extensive repeating earthquake catalogs. Most parts of the world don't have those things, right? So, but INSAR works everywhere. There's INSAR satellites flying all the time around the, around the world mapping constantly. And you can get, some of them have repeat intervals uh, as low as a, a couple of days. So you can get change happening over time. You can record the change that's happening over time. So if these repeating earthquakes can tell us a little bit about how the seismic hazard, how the risk changes over time, right? There's a seasonality to that risk. Meaning that some years are more risky for larger earthquakes than other years. Well, that's great for California, but what would be really cool is being able to show that anywhere where a satellite flies over. So if we can see that same signal uh, in the INSAR, then maybe we can translate this to other parts of the world that don't have such robust geophysical sort of laboratories in their backyards so that they can better assess earthquake hazard as well. So that's the goal, is being able to kind of tie this back to sort of a, a more time-dependent model of earthquake hazard forecasting. That's sort of the idea. All right, so that was what I did as a grad student. And now I want to tell you a little bit about the place where I work uh, now, which I feel uh, pretty excited. Well, I've been there for four years, and I still think it's a pretty awesome place. Uh, but I'm going to show you like a quick little three-minute video that tells you something about, about the place I'm working. One of the big questions that people always ask is kind of, where am I? The best way to answer that question is with geodesy. Geodesy is actually the study of Earth and where we are on Earth, the shape of the Earth, the size of the Earth, the orientation, how it's placed in space, and the gravity field. If you really want to understand some of the big scientific questions related to earth and natural hazards, we really want to be able to pinpoint exactly where we are and exactly how much the earth is moving. Geodesy made it a science of now. We could now, instead of saying what the Atlantic Ocean did over the past 200 million years, we could say the Atlantic Ocean is an inch wider than it was at this time last year. 
we're learning about the processes of the Earth's deep interior, we're learning about the processes that produce geological hazards, we're learning about the processes that shape the Earth's surface. We will get better and better at describing how the Earth w works as a function of space and time simply by making those measurements on the surface. And so that's where UNAFCO comes in. UNAFCO is an organization of universities that operate a facility on behalf of National Science Foundation to support all the U.S. scientists who use the geodesy technologies in research all over the world. And I use geodesy to study plate boundary zone deformation and magma tectonic interactions. How we get large earthquakes in the middle of continents. Flooding. High resolution topography. Crustal deformation. Biomass estimation. Volcano deformation and earthquake processes. And we help them with the, the really tough challenges of logistics. You know, making measurements on top of volcanoes in uh, Central America, or looking at uh, ice movements uh, on glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica, or even making uh, atmospheric measurements and earthquake observations all around the uh, Caribbean. We also operate on behalf of the community the Earth Scope Plate Boundary Observatory. This is uh, over a thousand geophysical instruments, such as GPS um, receivers, um, antennas, such as the one behind me. Um, strain meters, tilt meters, seismometers that are used to measure deformation of the uh, western United States and Alaska. Uh, initially the reason why UNAVCO was started was because GPS receiver technology was very, very expensive. So what the National Science Foundation decided to do was uh, provide a sort of cooperative environment in which people could share resources. UNAFCO really brings everything together in a place where people can be much more creative than they could have been if they were working on their own. The role that UNAFCO plays is to create community, to bring together people looking toward a common cause, to understand the Earth and the Earth systems. A lot of what I've learned has come from um, the UNAFCO field engineers teaching me along the, along the way. UNAFCO facilitates this ability to share this information, share our observations, share our technologies. So that's where I work now. <clears throat> um, and it's, uh, it's a pretty cool place. Um, you know, our role is essentially to facilitate people doing research using geodesy. So using the tools of measuring the Earth our job was to support, and you can see we've got, um, you know, instruments everywhere. Um, you know, our, our most dense network is here along the along the coast, all the way up through Alaska and, and down along the Pacific coast here. There's, we maintain about 1,100 instruments between Baja and, and Alaska, but there's also a slew of them uh, throughout uh, other parts of the world that I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a little bit here. And so our job is when someone gets um, you know, someone makes a proposal to the National Science Foundation for a grant. Um, our job is to help them to do their research, and that's a that's a that's a it's a pretty fun pretty fun thing to do. So this is not the same as the GPS in your phone, right? The technology, the satellites are all the same, but the technology itself is really different. And I'm going to show you a little bit about the hardware, a little bit how, a little bit about how uh, the, this whole system works. Uh, but we need these systems. You know, if your phone dies, it's not too hard to find your way around. Um, but these things, we need them to function out in really, really, really rugged areas. And we need, the, we need to know that they're going to just keep working and keep sending data back. So the big part of our job is to design and then repair uh, these systems to make sure that data is getting back. Uh, sort of to the mothership in, in Boulder. So this is up uh, somewhere, uh, I'm not sure which mountain that is, but this is somewhere up in the, in the Cascades. Um, this is a, a protective radome that goes over the antenna. That first image that I showed you with the antenna, that's the actual choke ring antenna. This is just a little cover that goes on top of it um, to keep out the elements and stuff like that. Uh, some of these sites use you know, radio links that link them back to other sites that then upload the data. Some of them use uh, satellite dishes in order to get the data back. Uh, but a lot of, you know, it's funny because I, when I was 19, I was working as a sysadmin doing IT. And really, after all the school that I did, that's kind of still what I'm doing. It's just for a really different purpose. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, GNSS. So GNSS, you guys have all heard the term GPS, right? Global Positioning System. That's the American 
GNSS system. GNSS is Global Navigational Satellite System. And we have GPS or Navstar uh, is sort of the formal name. But there's also a Russian system called GLONASS. There's a European system called Galileo. China has a system called Baidu. Um, India's got a system that they've got going as well, but other systems, the US and the Russians have really large full global uh, coverage. Other countries just have maybe a couple of geosynchronous satellites that are in their, that are over their country so they can do their own positioning without relying on foreign governments. Uh, but so I want to talk a little bit about how trilateration works, right? Because there's this, there's this sort of confusion that GPS, that, that your GPS unit is communicating with a satellite, and that's not how it works. Each satellite is sending out a signal. So if you've got one satellite right here, it's sending out a signal. And let's say that you are, that, that you're receiving information from that satellite. It's telling you two pieces of information. It's telling you, one, where that satellite is. And two, it's telling you what time it thinks it is. And it's getting its time from an atomic clock. And there's all kinds of corrections that go into this stuff. You have to account for general relativity because it's farther away from the Earth. And so those atomic clocks actually drift and they can cause an error. An error of a nanosecond is about a foot on the ground. So we're talking about tiny, tiny, tiny errors in time will create larger errors in your actual information. So imagine that you are at, you know where the position of the satellite is and you know how long it took for that signal to get to you, right? Because it's broadcasting its time. So with its location and time, you can figure out the distance that you are away from that satellite. So you are somewhere, from satellite one, you are somewhere on this ring, but you could be anywhere on that ring, right? So get another satellite involved, and you know that you are this distance from satellite number two, right? which means that where they intersect, you could either be here, because you have to be, if you're, if you're this distance from satellite one and this distance from satellite two, you have to be either here or here at those intersections. Right, make sense so far? So you add a third satellite and that limits your options down to just one spot. That's the idea. Uh, in reality, we don't use just two or three satellites. Uh, we don't, three would be the minimum, but that doesn't, there's still, there's significant error. Errors are introduced, yeah? Wait, what is the satellite two again? Well, so these are, these are just satellites that are up, these are GNSS satellites that are up in orbit. And so there's, uh, the US has a constellation of, I wanna say like 20 different satellite vehicles, uh, Russia, similar number. So one satellite is not enough to, ter to determine your position. You've gotta have at least three uh, to determine a position. And ideally more. Because there's never perfect intersection, okay? There's, there's errors that are introduced by the delay of the signal coming through the ionosphere, through weather, there's clock errors, there's all kinds of little errors that, that mean that this isn't a perfect intersection. So the more satellites you're tracking, the better off you are. And of course, it's not actually two-dimensional, right? It's three-dimensional, these are spheres. You can think of these as, um, you know, when you know your distance from one of these satellites, you're actually not knowing it on a, on a circle, you're knowing your distance from that in a, in a sphere, on, on, the, on the surface of that sphere. Does that kind of make sense? This is about, I mean, in, this still isn't busy enough to be accurate, right? You actually need a whole bunch more satellites that are all feeding into that, to that information to get a, a really true picture. But this, this basically outlines how that GPS works. Again, it's a passive, for your phone or for whatever, it's a passive signal, it's being received. Nothing's being sent back to the, the satellites. All right, so what is my day-to-day, -day, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna be coming back to how that GPS stuff works, but what my day-to-day -day office, my day-to-day -day work looks like. About half my time is in an office or in a warehouse. I'm maintaining our vehicles and inventories and organizing visits with landowners. You've got to correspond. You know, we, I said we've got 1,100 sites between Baja and Alaska. And some of them are on, you know, some of them are on school campuses, or some of them are on private land, some of them are on BLM land, some of them are on national parks. They're everywhere, and all of those relationships need to be maintained to, to keep those permits up. Uh, part of it is planning larger projects. Um, you know, it, we organize a lot of our sites that, are, that have 
uh, visual line of sight capability, we'll organize them with radio networks. So instead of paying for, you know, if we've got 10 sites, instead of paying for communications at each site, you know, 50 bucks a month for a cell modem at each site, or you know, 100 bucks a modem, 100 bucks a month for a for a uh, satellite dish, we organize them into radio networks so that all of them can f send their data to one place and then upload it from there. Uh, so that saves us a lot in monthly communications costs and things like that. Uh, so prepping equipment, uh, reporting, you know, all of our money comes from the National Science Foundation, which means we're accountable to Congress. And so my, you know, my boss, when I first started, was sort of like, look, you have the freedom to spend what you need to spend to do your job, but if you, <laughs> You should always be prepared to sit in front of Congress and tell them why you spent that money. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's sort of our, our rule of thumb. A lot of organizations that have been contracted out by the NSF have run into problems um, with questionable expenses. So that tends to be a pretty uh, large topic of concern. Uh, the other half of my time is in the field. And that's, the, that's, the, that's where the really fun stuff is. Um, so it's upgrading sites with new hardware, fixing sites that are broken, doing reconnaissance for new sites, installing new, new uh, GPS monuments, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so really quickly, this is what, uh, our team is five, five people uh, in the Southwest region. There's a, a sixth engineer who does uh, some work up in Northern California, uh, but this is my team. We've got roughly a responsibility of about 140 stations per person, and with that, we manage better than 99% data, data return. Um, that means that of all those 1,100 sites, uh, we're not losing, we're, we're only losing a fraction of a percent of the data from system breakdowns and from data not being recorded. I'll tell you, I'll, we'll get into some of the various things that can happen to these things. Um, between nature and humans, they face a lot of threats <laughs> uh, because they're out there operating for years on end without anybody looking at them. So we'll get into some of that stuff. But you know, in the last 12 months, there were 172 days in the field fixing 750 issues, something like that, 650 issues. So some of our sites are really fun to visit. They're beautiful. This is a site near Paso Robles, um, and this is a very typical uh, GPS monument or GNSS monument of the sort that we, we put in manually by hand. So this, uh, this is thinner steel, it's one inch steel rod, and what a group of engineers probably took them about a day, maybe two, and they came out with large construction drills. Uh, gen we pull up generators and use large hammer drills with really large bits. We drill four holes, one for each leg, usually about six to eight feet into bedrock manually by hand, and it uh, takes a lot of work. And you pump it full of epoxy, and then you throw these, these uh, metal rods down, weld them all together up at the center, uh, level it as best you can, and then put a, put a GPS antenna on the top of it. Uh, this is a site, uh, again, in the Eastern Sierra, Mazurka Peak. This is sort of an atypical site. You know, normally there's just a little box on, on and somewhere nearby, an antenna that looks like this. Uh, but in this particular case, we've got multiple, we've got extra solar panels, we've got all kinds of radio um, antennas because these are picking up data from other stations. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the things about this job is that, you know, this site is uh, an, about an hour and a half up a, from the main road. The main road itself still being another hour or two from anything like medical care. So that's one of the biggest dangers, uh, is that we're way out, um, sometimes in the middle of nowhere, and we have to be pretty self-sufficient. So oftentimes we'll take two vehicles if we can, that's really kind of a luxury. Uh, in really remote places, we'll try to do that, or if we have hazards like climbing involved uh, with the job, we'll try to take more than one vehicle, but we're often operating by ourselves. So some of our sites are spectacular, right? They're really, really cool, fun to visit, beautiful sites, and then others are less so. Uh, this is uh, on a, I think, uh, near a reservoir uh, in Imperial Valley, uh, which has many, many uh, cool areas to go to as well, but this is also kind of typical of one of these sites. Yeah. How do you determine where, you said it's an hour and a half, how long that? So the original, so the question was whether, how, how we determine where to put one of these, one of these stations. And it's, 
the original, so this project uh, just, it was a 15 year project and it started in 2005, 2000, no, it can't be right, 2007. And it was the community of folks that were interested in studying these things all got together and picked out targets. And there was a, you know, a board of people that, you know, everybody had ideas, oh, we want stations here, we want stations here. And a group of researchers all got together and hashed out where these sites should go. We have X amount, you know, we're, we're pitching the NSF for this amount of money to build a network of this size, and where should we put these things? And they would give us targets of maybe two kilometer radius or something like that, and say somewhere in here, we'd really like to put a GPS monument. And so engineers would go out to that two kilometer radius, and just look around, try to contact landowners. Sometimes it's easy, the whole radius is in the BLM land, you go out there, you find a suitable location, and then you pitch it to the BLM and say, we'd like to put in a site here. Uh, other times, you know, if it's in an urban area, that might encompass dozens of different properties. And so you find an appropriate location, and then you try to think about a landowner that will work with you. That's, that's right. So sometimes it's super easy, and I'll, I'll, I'll get, we'll get into that. Sometimes, so, sorry, sometimes you can just drive right up. Um, but some sites just aren't like that. They wanted a site in that area, and that area is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. And that thing of just collecting really accurate information about exactly where it is. Yep, all it's doing, so this this is, a, yeah, so I'll point out really quick, this is a different type of monument. You see these legs are a little bit thicker. This was actually drilled by a rig. So in sites where where we are able to bring in a drill rig, that's what we would prefer to do. And these legs actually go about 40 feet into the ground in all directions. But so also, like, it's some it's a sort of, it's a specific distance from the fault, which I think was... Well, it's at a defined location, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it is just, all it's doing is collecting data. Uh, and it collects data, we record data at about, um, well, we record it at 15 samples per second, uh, but most of our files are just one, uh, one sample every 15 seconds, makes a daily file of about two megabytes or something like that. And that's the main data product, is that daily file, which is comprised of one sample every 15 seconds, uh, and usually then that gets processed into a daily position. But by having a, a large number of observations, you reduce your uncertainty. Yeah? Oh, I noticed on the globe that you had, that there's a lot, California, uh, Alaska. So I'm assuming you have a lot of these around the room fire. Well, so all of, all of the, the sites that we have, most of, the, uh, most of our sites are in the U.S., but yeah, all along the, the Pacific Coast, the U.S. Pacific Coast, Japan has their own systems. They have an extraordinary uh, geophysical network over there. Um, and yeah, so there's, I mean, our, our primary interest in this particular project was that plate boundary, was the plate boundary. So yeah, that is, yeah, the, the, what for us is our, our little section of the fire. And then how can you guys exchange data with like Japan or other countries? I mean, the ring fire is like a big thing, you know, because all the, that's where the earthquake falls. Right. So, because we're funded by the National Science Foundation, all of our data is made publicly available immediately. So, this data goes from the satellite to this antenna, and at the end of the day, it is you can go download it. Yeah. So, the, it is it is downloaded and used by large numbers of of different users. Some of them are other countries doing research. Some of them are, you know, some of these streams, you know, a lot of the sites, when it was originally conceived, they would collect the data for a day and upload that data, and at the end of the day, you, you now go and provide a position for where it was that day. And uh, that's the way a lot of the sites operate, but we are, that's not what the community wanted. You know, after 15 years of, of, of evolving uh, this project, uh, they didn't just want to see a daily file, people wanted to see real-time data. And so a lot of that data now is being sent out in streams that are being collected at UNAFCO and rebroadcast. And so that stuff is used by land surveyors, it's used by, um, it's, you know, two of our biggest downloaders uh, of data are Apple and Google. And it's because they're using those, those very, very well-defined points. We're pretty sure that what they're doing with it is incorporating it into automatic car algorithms, driving algorithms.
So there's a lot of different uses. And again, sometimes it's not accessible by truck, sometimes it's not accessible by uh, any other method, uh, and so we've got to fly. So every once in a while we get to, we get to go fly up. This is somewhere near Mount Baldy, uh, up at, uh, down, down in Southern California. Uh, this is a, a site that's you know, out down this way. This is Lake Mead, and so my boss and I went, when we had to do a repair there, we'd drive over to Las Vegas, rent a boat, and uh, load up all of our stuff. We've got a satellite dish here and uh, other pieces of equipment, and we got as close as we could to the site and then hiked all the equipment up to the site. Um, and sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes you just pull off on the side of the road. You know, a lot of our sites are on Caltrans right away. You, if you've driven up and down five, you've probably seen these um, somewhere along on the side of the road. Or if you didn't before, you will now. Um, there's several of them along, along Interstate 5 and around other highways as well. And so those are pretty easy. You just pull over and you can do, do your work and, and get it done. But they're you know, obviously a little less exciting to visit. Uh, so sometimes the road is like that, right? And sometimes the road is like that. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an OHV park, uh, off-road vehicle uh, park in Anza Borrego. And this is one of those great examples where I'm hours away from absolutely anything. Uh, and the roads look like that. And sometimes it's a good day, and sometimes it's not such a good day. And you wind up digging yourself out of sand or whatever. That's, so <laughs> it's a really funny cross-section of uh, skills that you have to bring to bear uh, in a job like this, right? There's, there's an element of data analysis. You've got to understand the science to some degree. There's a lot of IT work where you're sort of basically just fixing computer parts more than anything else. And you've also got to be willing to do this kind of stuff out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so there's, there's kind of a, it, it winds up being kind of a special set of people that like to do this kind of stuff. This is a typical, um, contents of one of our enclosures is the GPS receiver that's actually recording all the data. This is, in this case, a cell modem that's taking the data from that receiver and broadcasting it back to Boulder. There's a little controller in here for the solar panels to charge the batteries properly and some basic electronics in the back. So that's a, that's a typical simple site. Some of them get more complicated because we have to add radios or we have to add other kinds of equipment. So those enclosures tend to get filled up with, with other stuff. Below this are uh, four large solar batteries, so 100 amp hour solar batteries. So there's about 400 amp hours of power, which will last us about a month, maybe four weeks. Um, so if, for, for instance, the solar panels get disabled or cut or smashed or whatever, this thing's still gonna work fine for almost a month, uh, unless it suffers something worse than that, which often happens. Uh, so there are terrible things that happen to these sites. Uh, sometimes they get buried in snow that can crush an antenna or uh, crush a ray down. Sometimes they get shot at, which is always kind of obnoxious. Uh, you know, again, a lot of our sites are out in the desert in the middle of nowhere, and it's just this, I mean, I guess uh, irresistible uh, to try to shoot at something like that. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes they get hit by cars, uh, and that can obviously introduce a, a bit of an offset in the time series. Uh, and this one got, uh, got swept away through a, a flow, a lava flow uh, on Augustine Volcano up in Alaska. And every once in a while, of course, humans are also tend to be a bit of a problem. I, I don't know if anybody here remembers the earthquake. It wasn't a big one, but it was a you know, four and a half, five magnitude earthquake that happened up in Napa in 2014. So uh, this is the nearest station to, uh, to that earthquake. It's uh, Waterbird. Uh, it's located, let's see if I can remember. Uh, it's, it's located here-ish, somewhere around here. And it was the, one of the nearest stations to the, to the earthquake. These stations, to install one of these stations, right, to bring out a drill rig, drill this stuff, have, it probably takes two or three engineer days to, to get all the stuff installed. And the cost of the drill rig and the cost of the materials, it's probably thirty or $40,000 on average to install one station. And so, you know, they're there to record everything, but you really want to record earthquakes that happened nearby. This was the station about one month before that earthquake happened, and this was the station about two days before that earthquake happened. Really, really unlucky timing. Some enterprising fellow uh, 
drove up a truck and just lopped the entire thing off and just dropped it in their truck and drove off. Uh, so what they got out of that were, uh, let's see, uh, two solar panels, two used, heavily used solar panels, uh, four batteries uh, that were probably also used. All of that stuff, I, I can't imagine, fetches a ton of money. Uh, the GPS instrument's probably worth like five or ten grand, but I don't know where you fence a used scientific GPS instrument. So I, I don't know what they did with that. But at any rate, <laughs> this is, these things happen sometimes. Uh, and so when it does, we tend to respond well, by armoring the heck out of it. So uh, instead of just a pole, everything's encased in concrete, now everything's encased in steel, polycarbonate on the front. So on stations where we know that this is a risk, we really go all in. The whole thing is now encased in steel, and hopefully that won't happen at this particular site again, but who knows. Um, that, sometimes other things happen. Uh, this, was a, this was a site over in, uh, the Amargosa Valley, so over by an area that, near, near the southern end of uh, Death Valley National Park. And there was a trailer here at a field camp that's used by college kids that uh, stay at this little field camp, and then they do mapping and stuff like that in the mountains nearby. And uh, we had this as our upload point for several sites, and that's actually our satellite dish right there. Um, so sometimes, you know, you just, you can't tell what's gonna happen. There's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh, this is a station up in Alaska, um, and that's a bear um, hugging up on our GPS monument. And uh, this was taken by a webcam that was installed there because we know we have a lot of bear activity. Um, and we want to be able to see, sometimes they'll chew on stuff and, and make a problem. I have a, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague uh, named Ellen, who's been many times working in Ethiopia doing GPS work, and their, one of their big concerns is hyenas. So she is worried about how to hyena-proof. That's, the, you know, so sometimes your job is looking at data, sometimes it's figuring out how to hyena-proof uh, a GPS monitor. Okay, so here's a larger map. Uh, I, I just like this map, it came from a uh, part of the geological survey. So this shows a whole, all of these are GPS sites. All of these little dots are GPS sites. Uh, some of them are ours, a lot of them are ours, some of them are you know, operated by other universities. And what they're showing is the rate at which those sites are moving with little tiny arrows. I'll show you a more detailed example of this in just a minute. I'm actually running pretty low on time, so I'm going to skip past that. Uh, we've got sites as well in the uh, Antarctic and, and Greenland uh, that present obviously their own logistical challenges uh, throughout uh, different parts of Africa. Uh, this is, a, this is me on an oil rig. This is a site platform harvest that's right off of Southern California. This is part of the global geodetic network that we maintain partly for NASA. And this is, these are the instruments with which NASA calibrates everything else they do on the Earth. So these have to be, you know, these are really, really uh, well-maintained instruments. Uh, here's some of the installation processes, drilling one of these monuments by hand, uh, welding, uh, dropping a pole in with a crane, and this is one of the actual drill rigs that's used to do the, the deep drill base brace monuments. Uh, yeah, so there's all kinds of logistical challenges when we can't drive, sometimes we have to fly, sling loads on a helicopter. Um, Heidi right here is, uh, I think, connecting a sling load for the, for the helicopter pilot to take to a site. Sometimes we're traveling by, by boat. Uh, sometimes there's no option except to just put generators, welders, tools, all of it on your back and just carry it out. Uh, all the data is available for free. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit real quick here about um, or how, what, what time do you like to get folks, everybody leaves at 6? Okay, cool. Uh, I'll make sure there's enough time for uh, questions and stuff. So we talked, a, uh, Rance mentioned the, the ring of fire, which is sort of all of this and all of this, right? But these are all the different tectonic plates, and this is the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where North and South America are going that way, and Africa's going that way, and the Atlantic is growing. Uh, over here is an area where uh, the Southern Pacific Plate is subducting under South America, right? and as it subducts under, that pushes up mountains, so you get volcanoes and the Andes right here from, from, that, from that action. 
uh, that's the same process that's happening up here in Alaska and in the Cascades. So all that stuff is subducting under here. And so you get large mountains, you get earth, you get, um, and, uh, and volcanoes as well. What's happening for us is a little bit different, right? But anyway, so these are, these are the, the plates. And uh, you're undoubtedly familiar with the earthquakes are concentrated on those plates. So this is where, or on those boundaries. This is where most of those, most of those events happen. So there's three different types that I mentioned. So there's divergent boundaries. So that's like the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge where the continents are separating. There's convergent boundaries, right? Where you've got mountain building along the Andes, up in Alaska. Uh, that's where an ocean plate is colliding with a, with a continental plate. But there's also, of course, continental plates that collide with other continental plates and push up massive mountains like the Himalayas. And what we are more familiar with, because this is in our backyard, are transform boundaries. These have less potential for really, really large earthquakes. You're not usually going to get magnitude 8, magnitude 9 earthquakes out of faults like that, uh, but you get up to magnitude 7 pretty readily, uh, which is what we're worried about here. So here we are, right, in the Bay Area. Uh, and I think it's really fun to, to spend some time on Google Earth and, well, uh, and, and, and look at uh, some of the features that you can see and in this case, even without highlighting where the faults are, it's not too hard to see in the geography where some of these things are. I mean, straight lines are pretty abnormal in nature, right? So when you see this large straight line right here that connects all the way up to here, you've got a pretty good indicator that there's something funny going on. And probably most of us are familiar with that. That's the San Andreas Fault that runs along there. The Hayward over here uh, and all that. But these are just the faults that have historically had earthquakes. Here's some of the others that have been active in the last few thousand years, but maybe have not had, uh, had any significant events. And so if you're gonna have all of those faults, you've gotta be able to measure what's in between all those faults. And so you want, you know, if you wanna measure the displacement across this fault, you want one instrument on one side and one on the other. But you've got a lot of faults in a lot of different areas. So we have instruments all over the place uh, in the Bay Area. So these are just ours. Um, and Berkeley operates more other, other institutions op operate even more instruments than this. Uh, so what happens here is the satellite information comes down to the antenna, goes through a cable, and up into, uh, up into the box where it then eventually gets uh, recorded by the GPS receiver and then sent to Boulder for processing where it becomes available pretty much immediately. So two of the nearby sites are P176 and 178. All right, these are, these are pretty nearby. I uh, haven't been to 178 before. I was at 176 not too long ago. And there's another one down here, uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. Uh, but I'm just focusing here since we're, since we're so nearby. I'm gonna look at these two sites. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the time series. So this is, you know, I've been showing you lots of pictures of the equipment and all that kind of stuff. This is the actual data. This is what we're really producing. This is a time series. This is uh, displacement. I'm sorry, this is uh, cut off here on the side, but uh, it's the same as this. North on the top, east on the, in the center, and height or, uh, on, the, on the bottom here. So there's some stuff here that's, uh, uh, I should point out, the displacement here, keep in mind that this data looks really messy and this looks really clean, but you've got you know, a range of 350 millimeters or something here and a range of only about 50 millimeters here. So this, this actually is a bit messier than it looks on this, uh, on this, uh, on this plot, but I wanted to just look, they look pretty similar, right? They're right next to each other, they look pretty similar to one another. They're both going basically north, they're both going basically west, uh, right, negative east, so west. And they're both kind of bouncing around in, in height. There's a lot of seasonal stuff that happens in there, um, ground swelling and stuff like that happens uh, because of aquifers and all that. So that's part of why this is a little messier. But I'll point out a couple little spots where things are a little different. If you look at those two, inside those two circles, you can see a little variation between them there and a little bit of variation between them here. Now, if we remove the trend and just look at the residuals, right? So what we're doing is we're removing that, we're removing that slope, just looking at the data without that trend in it. Then we can start to see there's something a little bit different happening at each site. So again, 176, this is on the west side of the San Andreas Fault. 178 on the east side of the San Andreas Fault. And this side, you can see a little bit of offset right over here um, in, the, uh, in the north and a much larger offset here in the east. 
So what's going on there? When did it happen? Sometime in 2014. And did it happen instantly? Did it happen over a day? It looks like it happened over months or the better part of a year. So I think that what you're seeing here is you're seeing the effect of that Napa earthquake that we talked about, right? That Napa earthquake that happened, you know, 80 miles away uh, up in Napa. That, that earthquake changed the stress on the San Andreas Fault, right? The, this is one of the things that, that you really start to get into is changes on one fault increase and decrease the stress on other faults. And so what you're seeing here is there wasn't any kind of sizable earthquake here, right, in, in 2014. Uh, but what you're seeing is the effect of that stress change that happened 80 miles away, right here, just being recorded just north of here. Um, so that's why having a larger network helps you to better understand this fault interaction. Uh, I'm just gonna go through, now, nah, let's see. How much, should we, it's pretty much six here. I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, dig into this too much, but I'll, I'll make this uh, presentation available. So I'll skip through, that was just, we were gonna sort of look through what it's doing. But we'll zoom out, so there's 178 and 176. And it's hard to tell on a screen like this, but you may be able to tell that this arrow is slightly shorter than this one. It's because there's the fault in the middle, right? And everything on this side's moving that way a little bit faster than things on this side. You zoom out, you can see a little bit more of the broader picture, a little bit more variation. So here's a site that's moving pretty slowly as compared to, say, the Farallons, which are moving a lot quicker. And as we zoom out further, and zoom out further, you get a better sense of what the whole continent is doing. We're all moving along this way relative to a stable North American continent. You have to set zero somewhere, right? So zero is the continent, and everything else is sort of moving relative to that. And this is pretty weird right up here. Anybody have any thoughts about why this is moving this way and we're moving that way? What's that? Oh, that's, uh, yeah, that could, be, that could be part of it. Anybody else got any ideas? So I mentioned that there's a couple different kinds of boundaries, right? One of them is the, is the transform boundary, which is what we have down here. What about up in Oregon and Washington? We've got the Cascades up there, right? And so the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting underneath the continental plate, and there's a, actually um, there's a collision happening here. And it's dragging the land inward. It's dragging the land inland as the sea plate is subducting underneath the continental plate. So you can really start to see the larger picture of what's, what's, actu uh, what's actually happening here. And this whole network leads to these pictures, this, this, this sort of view of our continent. So we go from the, the tiny scale to the global scale. That's pretty fun. All right, so uh, a little bit of unsolicited advice for anybody who wants it. Uh, if you, especially if you're interested in getting into into research as well. Uh, learn to code. The reason I was able to get into research was because my familiarity with Linux uh, and basic scripting that I came into it with, that laid, allowed me to get right into, into research when I got to Berkeley. Um, familiarity with Unix, uh, if you've got a Mac laptop, it's already there. You don't have to install or do anything funny. It's, Unix is underneath all of that stuff. Uh, take your time. Your fundamentals are gonna be important forever. I wish that I had better mastered trig and pre-calc and stuff like that, because that stuff just keeps coming up no matter what you're doing. Uh, and if you have an opportunity to do research, if you can work hard and follow instructions, researchers will put you to use. Uh, and living that process from an idea all the way to getting that cemented out into the world in a, in a journal or something is an extraordinarily satisfying thing. It's not a part of my daily life anymore at all. Now I'm about providing that data. But that perspective of having gone through that process has definitely made it a lot easier for me to do my job now. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, uh, check out uh, silkroad.com, this, this URL up here. I don't think there's actually anything currently um, available in our, in our jobs, but we do have internships, various internships, some of them specifically designed for community college students um, and undergrads and stuff like that. So uh, if you're interested in that, I can get your name on an email list or whatever, um, but yeah. That's it. Uh, thank you guys so much for, for having me. And, and for those that want,